All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. And Lily, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here today. It's, uh, it's, it's lovely to have been invited. Um, OK, I think I can share my screen now. Here we go. Working in with text in R. It's uh, not the snappiest of titles, but that's what we're doing today. Okay. So a little bit about me. I live in Oxford in, Eng in England, and I am currently studying for a PhD in statistics at the University of Warwick. My background is in lots of things related to math. Uh, I have degrees in math and philosophy, history and philosophy of science and technology, math education, and I used to be a secondary school math teacher as well. Basically, I really like anything to do with math. Um, that said, this talk has no math. As for me and R, I was introduced to it in 2014 as a course as part of my statistics masters. My first taste of ggplot2 came in 2015, and that's when I really started to, to get a feel for enjoying the language and, and working in it. In 2016, I wrote my first R package. In 2017, I started getting involved in the R community, and that was a, a real leap forward in, in terms of, of my love of uh, not only of R, but the whole environment around it. I've put some links to some of the uh, groups I've been involved in. The Oxford R user group is probably less interesting to, to people in Georgia, but um, I've also got involved in setting up a couple of R community groups groups for LGBTQ plus people. So there's a Slack group, which is Rainbow R, and a Twitter account, if anyone's interested in that. Um, in Earlier this year, I made my first Tidy Tuesday contribution, and in 2021, who knows what I'll do next, but one of the lovely things about R is there are so many opportunities to keep growing and developing um, in it. In terms of other firsts, last year I had my first child and I was off work, off my PhD for a year and I was looking for a project of something that could keep my toes in the water that wasn't too much like work but was enough, enough, enough like work to, um, uh, to keep my brain ticking over. And I decided to do this course here on my screen, this Introduction to Digital Humanities course, which is on edX. Um, it was a terrific course, uh, covered a wide range of topics, and one of the topics that it covered was working with text in R. Um, so I'm going to go through some of that. Well, not exactly that, because they did not use R in this course at all. They um, used the command line and a project called Voyant Tools. So I thought it would be a fun challenge for myself to see, could I recreate everything that they had done in this course in R? And that's what I'm going to show you, the R version of this course, or the text part of this course. The text that they were working with, it's a bit of a toy example, but uh, there we have it, was presidential speeches, State of the Union addresses from George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and asking questions about comparing those two speeches. So one of the questions was, do the lengths of sentences and presidential speeches over the course of a presidency change? Are they terse and to the point at the beginning and long and uh, long winded towards the end or do they say the same? And the methodology here was to take word counts of each sentence and calculate the average word count per sentence per speech with a view to get out a table with the year, month and sentence length recorded for each presidential speech. So I'll show you how to do that in R. The other tool they used was an interactive dashboard. It's available online at Voyant tools.org. Uh, it's, it's a terrific tool. I'm sure one could do something like this in Shiny. I haven't gone quite that far, but there are certain elements of this that I wanted to be able to recreate. So we've got some word clouds, we've got some word frequencies, word counts, and also looking at relationships between words. So you know, what comes on either side of, of words. Those are the kind of things we can do all of that in R as well. So these are some of the libraries that I'm going to be using in the talk today. We've got the Tidyverse, it's a very Tidyverse-based 
uh, talk. Of course, Stringer is going to be the main package in the tidyverse that we're using for dealing with text, but we're going to visualize a lot as well. We're going to be working with regular expressions and we're going to show the R verbal expressions library to get a taste of that. There's a fantastic tidy text package that is going to enable us to do very simply much of what I just described. For the word clouds, I'm going to show a couple of different examples using both the word cloud and the GG word cloud package. And we'll see a little bit of graphing in the tidy style as well. It's quite a code heavy talk. I'm not going to speak through line by line everything I've coded. Um, but I do like to include a lot of code in my talk. So if anyone wants to go back and recreate that, that's all available for you. Of course, I'll pull out a few highlights of the, the most important lines. So there are some text files associated with the talk. They are available in the GitHub repository that I've shared for this talk. And the first file that we're going to look at is the first of Washington's speeches. So you can read this into text and I'm going to show you it. It's a text file, so I'm going to show you it in a different program. I think I need to stop sharing the screen and start sharing a different screen to show you that. Right. Okay, so we have here our text and it is a bit of a mess. So there's some, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor or just the screen, but there's some um, quite a lot of extra punctuation in here. There's some HTML spans and tags. There's some Unicode encoding. There's a lot of extra white space coming into play and then at the bottom of the speech we've got some general bump related to the fact that it's from Wikipedia. Okay so we're going to need to tidy that up as our first uh, port of call so I'm going to stop sharing it again and go back to my presentation. Okay share screen again back to the presentation. Before we can clear that up, I'm going to do a quick diversion into regular expressions. So, um, oh, this is where it's nice if it's an in-person meeting, right? Because I can find out who knows what about regular expressions and, and how much to say. But I'll, uh, um, a quick taste of regular expressions, there, a sequence of characters that define a search pattern. So here's a, a simple example, dot E dollar sign. So we have the dot here stands for any character. It's the placeholder of any one character. E is the letter E. And the dollar sign anchors that regular expression to the end of a word. We're looking for any letter and an E at the end of a word. So we can take a, a, a test um, string. We've got uh, some, some fruit. And a great way to start seeing what regular expressions do is to use the str underscore view function from Stringer, um, which will look at our fruit and show us where in our text this search string occurs. So at the end of the words apple and orange, but it doesn't pick up the ea, the pe in pair because it's not at the end of the word. Uh, there are other things, well, Stringer is a, a hugely rich package, but a, a few other basic Stringer functions. Uh, once we have our vector of, of characters and our search pattern, we can get a true false for which items in that vector contain that string. We can extract the part, those parts of the string, um, or we can subset the words in the vector um, that contain that string, uh, just as a, as a starting point. But regular expressions can get out of hand pretty quickly. Um, there are, and to define search strings that can match something like any email that you could throw at it becomes extraordinarily complex. This is actually on the screen here, one of the easier ways. There's a, a fun discussion on Stack Overflow, which shows the, I think it's dozens, if not hundreds of lines of regex that are needed to absolutely capture every single email. Uh, so it's a lot to learn and a lot to remember to find, to define good reg, uh, regular expressions. 
And that's when I came across this really lovely little package uh, called Our Verbal Expressions that creates regex for you uh, by using a tidy verse like syntax where you use in words what, um, what you're trying to create. So for example, we want to get rid of these HML tags in our speech. So the HML ta tags, they start in this opening, uh, with this opening uh, pointy brace, then there's any amount of text in between it, and then it closes with another pointy bracket. So we use this Rx function to open up a regular expression, search, you tell it you want to find a pointy bracket, after that find any amount of other text except a pointy bracket until you get to a pointy bracket. And that returns a regex string that we can then use with our stringer expressions to help clean the text. There are lots of other regular expression um, resources out there. I've included a couple of lists, a couple of other links. So Rex is a package that tries to do the same kind of thing as our verbal expressions. Um, I like the syntax of our verbal expressions a bit more because of that type, the way it works with the pipe, but it's Rex is a great package as well. And then Reg Explain is a, uh, an R Studio add-in that lets you view various regular expressions and play with them within our studio. It's a lot of fun as well. Right, so we have our text that we read into R and we're going to clean it up. And the beautiful thing about Stringer, like lots of tidyverse functions, is that the language that they use is pretty clear. Even if you've never used Stringer before, it should be relatively clear reading through this code. Um, what each function is doing. So in the first highlighted line, we're using our regular expression that we defined before, span our x, and we are removing all of those spans from the text. We remove the Unicode and various other bits and pieces. Um, a fun string of function that I like is string underscore squish that just takes all the unnecessary white space out of the string. Extremely um, fussy to code yourself, but one line of string R and you've got it there. So at the end of running this code, we are going to have a clean text file um, and we are going to save that as text clean. I've included here some more links of stringer resources. There's um, uh, the package site, of course, a really good cheat sheet and a chapter of uh, Hadley Whitcomb's R for Data Science book that uh, contains um, a lot more information both about Stringer and about regular expressions, all really good resources. Okay, so we've got our clean text. Now we can start working towards, our, uh, towards answering our research question about sentence lengths. The tidy text package, as I mentioned, makes that really easy. It works by creating, uh, by saving the, uh, transforming the text into a tidy format. So it's easy to work with tidyverse packages and it tokenize them, tokenizes the text. And by tokenization, I mean, it splits up the text into workable, uh, workable and meaningful units, such as a word, a sentence on, and so, or so, so on. It was a package was created by Julia and David, and um, I'm hesitating about saying Julia's last name. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, and I don't want to embarrass myself with that. They've written an excellent book about it as well, which is available uh, free online. The link is there, and the tools are all contained in this tidy text package. So let's see it in, in practice. So because we're working in a tidy format, the first thing that we need to do is put our speech into a data frame. In, uh, so, sorry, into a tibble. So we do that in the first line, just a, a one by one tibble with um, the text in it. And then we use this unnest tokens function from, uh, from tidy text. Uh, we want to create sentences. That's the first argument. We are creating sentences from the column speech that we created before, and we're using the token sentences to split it up into sentence length. And at the end of this, we end up with a tibble where uh, we have one string 
uh, one line per sentence and the string of that sentence text is contained in, the, in, in that row. From there, absolutely, uh, uh, we, can, we can use uh, standard dplyr functions to summarize our data form. So we can create a sentence length um, by using the count function to count the words using this boundary word um, argument in each sentence, and then summarize it to get the mean sentence lengths over the course of that, uh, that data frame. So in the first State of the Union speech we have from Washington, the average sentence length was 38.2 words. Okay. Having done that for one speech, we want to see now how we can, we're trying to compare over the course of his presidency. So we are going to do pretty much the identical thing on multiple texts. The basis of the code here is, is the same, except we're going to use a function from per to read in uh, all the text files. So at this stage, we have a data frame with one speech per row. Uh, the text underneath it go through that same process of cleaning the text that we saw for the first Washington speech. Um, then we split it into sentences as before, except this time we have um, one row per sentence per speech. And then if we group by the speech name, we can use the same counting methods to, um, to get the mean sentence length for each speech. So that was the, the first research question that we had from the uh, Digital Humanities course, and that's how you answer it in R. As I said, we also have Jefferson. The code is absolutely identical, just swap Washington for Jefferson, and we get that for, for Jefferson. I've included Jefferson because we're going to see in a bit some more comparisons between Washington and Jefferson. Okay. Um, normally at this point I'd want to stop for questions, but I guess I should crack on and we can do questions all together at the end. Um, all right, so we've looked at sentence lengths, what about word counts? Um, similarly, uh, we can use the unnest tokens um, function from tidy text to uh, tokenize by words now rather than sentences. And we want to count the words we have in the speech. The result is not immediately interesting, right? Because our most common words that Jefferson, uh, that Washington uses are the, of, to, and in, a, which, be, that, and for. Doesn't really give us a good insight into Washington as a speaker. So these common parts of speech are known as stock words. And when doing text analysis, it's generally a good idea to remove them from the text so we can see what's left that's more particular to the speaker or the context. The tidy text package contains uh, the stop words data and we can remove stop words from our speech of interest by using the anti-join from dplyr to, to anti-join the stop words and now we get a sort and it looks considerably more promising. United public, citizens, governments, these are all the sort of words that we would expect to be prominent in State of the Union speeches. But we need to be careful. Something's missing and this is where it's good to have a sense of the context of your speech. So we see the word united and we're talking about presidents here and so you would kind of think there was another word that should go with that uh, but we don't see it why not well let's check if we look at our stop words the word states which we would often ex expect to follow united in presidential speeches is considered a stop word um, I guess states is considered in this in this context, in the stop words context, like um, says or some speaking action rather than United States. So 
Um, so state is considered to be a stop word, so it's been removed from our data frame. We want to put it back in. So we're going to modify the stop words data to have all the stop words except states and then go back and join those count again. And sure enough, the word states really should be in our data set. It's up there at the top. So we've got this word count data. Um, it would be good to visualize it. Here it is as a bar chart. It's pretty boring. Um, so this is where word clouds are popular. I have some, I hesitate with word clouds. I'm not sure they're always a good way of visualizing the data. Um, I will show you why in a sec, but let's take a look at it. So first up, we have the word cloud function. It's pretty straightforward to use. You take the words that you want from the word count data set, you take the frequencies, uh, the words, there are lots of words that only appear one or two times, they're going to completely clog it up. So we're going to say we only want words in the set that appear more than nine times. We're going to rotate some of them. We're going to pick a color palette and it gives us this. Um, now, what you don't see here is the warning message I got when I created this. It says that some of the words don't fit, so it's just randomly decided not to show them. Again, not great data analysis if, uh, or data visualization if the function that you are using decides on your behalf which words to, to show or not show. Um, there's also another function, another package, ggWordCloud, which if you like, uh, if you like ggplot and you like working in that very granular way, you can use uh, this added geom um, to, uh, to create a word cloud. So in this case, we're doing our filtering uh, of the counts being greater than the nine before we pass it to uh, the ggplot. We're using the geom text word cloud function. And then we have to play around with a few things to get it to, uh, to look good. Uh, the scale radius argument. Um, it's, there are a lot of options. It's, it's quite fiddly. It's well explained in the GG word cloud vignette. So I suggest if you want to play with this, um, you do that. It uses a slightly different algorithm to, uh, to create the word clouds. This one's a bit more spaced out, but it does have all the words we want. I don't think that looks great, but uh, it's, a, it's a first stab at it and uh, you can play around, maybe get something a bit, a bit tighter or if, if you like. Okay, so we've talked about individual words, uh, counting them, uh, but text is not made up of individual words, it is all connected. So what can we do to start understanding the relationships between words and the text? Another token you can use in, in um, tidy text is the n-grams, and that allows you to pull out a certain number of words together. Here we're setting n equals two, and the bigram is each pair of words with overlap on each line. So I embrace, embrace with, with great, great satisfaction. So these are our n-grams, and we can start to analyze what words appear together in a text. Now, a lot of these bigrams are going to contain stop words. So the first thing we're going to do is to remove the, separate the bigram into individual words and separate and remove from this data frame any bigram where either one of the words is a stop word. And here we get the pairs of words that appear most commonly together. So we have United States appears as a common bigram, fellow citizens, post office, etc. This is slightly less interesting on such a small data set. Um, the tidy text book go through an example using the entire corpus of uh, Jane Austen books, which provides a much richer data set. But as a, as a toy example, this is uh, gives you an idea. So now we have relationships, we can create a graph and I'm using the tidy graph package to do that. So we're 
uh, finding, I'm, I'm filtering out on any pair of words that appears more than once and I'm creating a graph using that, um, that time. I think I'm gonna go over here. So Lily, is it gonna be okay if we, I've just got a notice saying we've got 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, so we, if, yeah, I think that uh, the moment the, the meeting stops, we could uh, join again with the same link. And uh, so just okay. go on as you want for now. <laughs> okay, are there any questions coming up? Uh, am I going at an okay speed or is it? Yeah, I think the speed is okay. Okay, fine. So we've created a graph object and um, that contains information both about nodes, the, the individual words we have, and also the relationships between the words. So where do we have connections between, between pairs of words? And we can plot that. The syntax is very similar to ggplot, but it's a ggraph. And that gives us this. Um, we see United States, sort of, it, um, I'm pointing at my computer screen, that's completely unhelpful for everybody else. Um, we see United States, we see public at the center of a, a star um, on, the, on the left, but there's much we can do to improve this graph. So a quick stab at that. Uh, like ggplot2 in ggraph, we can um, add aesthetics to the edges or the nodes, so I am gonna put in arrows because these only give pairs of words. We don't know one word follows the other, so it's good to have an arrow to show that direction. And I'm going to make the strength of the line uh, relative to um, how often it occurs in the data set. So we see here that United States now um, comes out a little bit more prominently as a, the bigram that appears most often. But as I said, this is just a toy data set and the graph is still not particularly exciting, but hopefully enough to give you an idea of, of, of the capabilities. Another thing we can do is compare word frequencies in the two sets of texts. So the code above um, gives us a data frame where for we take each word that appears in either of the texts, either by Jefferson or by Washington, and gives the proportion of the speech um, that, that that appears in. There are lots of words that only appear in one text or the other. And I have highlighted here slice sample as a new verb in the dplyr uh, 1.0 zero which replaces sample underscore n just wanted to highlight things that are newer newer bits of code and so once we have these frequencies we can plot them and that's the code for the plot and it looks like this and this is quite a nice way of seeing visually which words appear more often in one text than another so we see kind of towards the lot top left corner that Jefferson uses the word force um, proportionally much more than Washington, whereas Washington in the bottom right corner is using the word national much more often uh, proportionally than Jefferson. So uh, that's another thing we can do if we've got two sets of texts, it might be say the corpus of works of two different authors or uh, there are various ways you can, you can use this. Okay, now we're gonna talk about sentiments. Uh, one thing that makes working with text data different than working with numeric data is that the uh, text conveys, um, contains meaning and, and emotion. So how can we keep, uh, how can we uh, work with that information in R? Again, this is something that's easy to do with the tidy text package. Um, there are three different ways that have that the tidy text package incorporates uh, putting a score to um, to words to to convey some level of of how positive or negative they are. So one um, is the affin um, or affin uh, sentiment scores, and we can see those with get underscore sentiments affin. And we see here 
uh, the the first few words that are that are considered uh, that that are scored and words relating to abandonment is is negative so at minus two, which isn't quite as bad as words relating to abhor minus three, um, and so on. We've got uh, about two and a half thousand words that are assigned a positive or negative score in AFIN. Another way of considering sentiments is the the Bing uh, is Bing, and that is a strict um, a division just into into positive or negative. And the another way of doing it is with this NRC uh, categorization, where each word is put into a, in a binary fashion into the categories of positive, negative, anger, anticipation, disgust, fear joy, sadness, surprise, and trust. And one word can have a difference of these sentiments. So we see that abandon um, is associated with fear and it's negative and it's associated with sadness. So how can we use those? Well, first of all, I'll just say a, a few things about working with sentiments. And, and why we should be cautious. So these are all based on one word. So they don't pick up on things like no good. It will see the word good and recognize that as a positive. It doesn't understand um, the no before it. These are all constructed either via crowdsourcing or the labors of one author. And they're validated on either some combination of crowdsources or Twitter data, restaurant or movie reviews, which is to say it's all based on very modern data. So we should definitely be hesitant about applying these sentiment lexicons to styles of text that are dramatically different from what they are validated on. Like, we should be very hesitant about applying this to presidential speeches from 230 years ago. I'm going to do it anyway, just as an example to show you how it can be done. There are much more sophisticated ways of doing this. Uh, there are domain specific lexicons available uh, for certain content areas. And there are also ways of, of dealing with this um, problem like the, the no good problem. But for an introduction, we are just going to stick with um, those sentiments. So like we used anti join to uh, get rid of stop words, we're now using inner join to attach the sentiments to the words uh, by word. I'm going to see if I can finish the talk in two minutes and then we can do the question and answer afterwards. So I'm going to rush this a little bit a bit, a bit so we can get sentiments. And here we are showing uh, the most positive and most negative words as they contribute to Washington speeches. Um, so not a particularly exciting chart, but there are much more exciting things that you can do with this. So I'm going to give you some examples for other texts. And actually, I don't like rushing. We've got less than a minute. So can we stop and we'll finish off in the next? OK, let's do okay. that. We OK, so we have here. I'm going to go back on one slide because there was something I was rushing. And there is something that's quite nice to point out about the GG plot code here as well, which is a relatively new feature in ggplot2 as of version 3.3.0, which is uh, we're using a geom col, and those are typically uh, vertical. Um, it used to be possible to get them horizontal by using the coord flip argument, uh, but now um, it's easier to do that without, in, instead of having what would have been x equals word and y equals n, if you just swap around those arguments as y and x, ggplot2 now automatically takes care of that for you. If you then add the geom call, it knows to do it the other way. And I think that's really, that's really neat. Um, another thing to, to watch out for is uh, that Again, words can mean different things in different contexts. So we have as the most negative word in the uh, Washington speech, object, uh, you know, to object to something is, is, is negative. But um, this could also be the word object, just a thing, which doesn't create 
a sentiment is neither positive or negative. So it's always uh, worth taking a look and seeing, does this make sense in the context? Um, another new function from dplyr 1.0.0 that we're using in here is slice max, which replaces the old uh, top underscore n. Um, it's uh, this time we need to give an argument what we're ordering it by. And we've said n equals five, but you'll see in neither of these cases, we actually have five rows um, because we have ties. So it includes all the ties. And, um, and then if we have more than five rows, it doesn't give us five different things. Uh, but I think that's, if you want strictly five rows, you can use the slice underscore head um, as an alternative. So that's a very basic thing we can do with sentiment. I'm going to show you a couple of much more interesting plots that other people have created. So this is from the tidy text book and this is the sentiment analysis across Pride and Prejudice, the, the Jane Austen novel. Um, so it looks at how positive or negative the sentiment is in each 80 line uh, chunk of the text and and then plots that across the duration of the book and it shows the differences of doing that on the three different sentiment lexicons and as you can see they all work slightly differently but they all seem to track generally which bits of the book are more positive and and more negative so that's from tidy text and the code to create that is in the tidy text book and this is a new type of plot uh, by Cedric Scherher, which is um, he contributed to Tidy Tuesday, and he's using sentiment with the Animal Crossing data set to look at reviews and um, see what are positive and negative words in different reviews based on the grade uh, which you are in Animal Crossing. And we see the most positive, he's made them bigger up at the, at, uh, down at the bottom and the most negative up at the top and pointing out that the word fun appears across all grades, whether it's positive or, or negative. So that's another fun thing you can do with sentiment text. And on the next slide, I've got the link to the code for that, um, along with some other resources. So um, I don't work with text Professionally, I don't use a, I work a lot with strings in my data sets for my PhD, but not really with kind of understanding or analyzing text. So this is just really very introductory based on other introductory guides. Um, but there are other tools that I came across when preparing this talk that I thought were interesting. And I've put some links to them on this slide in case anyone would like to follow up on that. Um, Thank you very much. This is me. These are my contact details. And I would love to take any questions that you would have. I'm also very happy to have a much more general discussion about R, working in R. Um, really anything you want to ask me, I'd be happy to try and answer. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few questions. Um, I don't know if you can see them in chat or I will just start from the beginning uh, reading them. Uh, so, uh, and, and I mean, if somebody has any question, they can just post it here uh, or ask also uh, yourself. Yeah, I can see a couple of questions in the chat, but I think that's from this meeting. I can't see the ones. Okay, so, so, so the first one was um, about the string functions. If can, yes. it, can string functions replace uh, regex all together? Well, they work in combination. So um, it's probably better if I keep sharing my screen actually, so I can go back and show you bits of, of code. So let me just go back to, to that. So what the string functions, the string of functions are doing is they are allowing you to do different things with certain bits of regex. So, so if you see on this slide that we're combining, um, all, all of these functions have as their first argument, the text that you are searching in 
And the second argument is the search pattern that you are using for that text. So you are using regex in the stringer function um, to, to search or extract or, or subset or, or split by or remove or, or various other things that, that, um, that stringer can do. Not all stringer functions uh, take take uh, regular expressions. So, for example, um, you've got this string squish function, which doesn't need an argument. It's just removing white space. But if you want to, say, replace something or remove something, it needs to know what it is you want to replace or remove. And, and that can be just a regular character string, but it does also have the, op the option to, to use these regex patterns. Mm. I hope that answers the question. But, yeah. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Um, so I'll maybe ask a few more technical questions first. Uh, so there was also a question about uh, if the word uh, United States or if the term United States can be treated as one word or would that be difficult to code? Right, yes. Yeah. So um, with the tokenizations, um, you have to split it out uh, one way or another. So you can either split it by word or you can split it by n-gram and then you pull up these pairs of words. I suppose if you wanted to treat United States as all one word, you could do a find and replace using regex where, for example, you search for the string United Space States and replaced it with the string USA or something like that. And then that would be recognized as one word when you then split it up by text. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, I think you'd probably want to use USA rather than US, otherwise that would recognize as the word us. And then, and then that might uh, get confusing too. There are, there are lots of pros and cons to various different decisions that you make. So, so for example, I, I, in this slide, there's the line under string squish, string uh, replace all, where I replace, where I remove all hyphens and replace it with white space. And that was because some, in some cases in the tidy version, there were words that um, weren't being treated separately that very much should have been treated separately. But then once I removed the hyphens, there were some words that really should have been hyphenated like cooperation that then got lost. So if you're really, if you're actually really using this in an important application, you probably really do want to be very specific and careful with how you're handling, handling your text and not necessarily use such brute methods, but be more specific with how you deal with each individual word, mm. if there are words that are particularly important. So there is uh, quite a lot of uh, technical work, like with the cleaning the text, I guess that takes uh, a large part of the... Uh, it certainly can be. Yeah. Um, so one more question. Do you know a practical way to reverse sentiment score for negative bigrams uh, and where there's a neg negation of a positive negative word? I don't know that personally. I think they cover that a bit later on in the tidy text book but i'm not sure mm. okay. um, there are methods i'm afraid i don't know i'm sorry okay. and then we had one one link elvira posted um a link uh, of board cloud more fancy alternatives so it's the r graph um, gallery i, I oh great okay it. so uh so that's good to know uh, and then I was just wondering also, um, because I'm not really familiar with text analysis or like text, text information. So what kind of conclusions are usually made based on like sentence length or, or things like that? Like, does it vary over time if you analyze text from, from more historical times uh, to more modern times or is it like context specific? Things? Well, those the the application there are a range of applications and and you've just raised to where that's absolutely absolutely the kind of questions that this methodology can answer so yeah. so for the 
course, the, the digital humanities course, that the question was, do the lengths of the presidential speeches change over time? Um, and I didn't really kind of answer that research question because it's really just such a toy data set if you only take four speeches it doesn't really answer the question but that's the idea that if you had the full corpus of the speeches mm. um, and you were to run the analysis on all of them you might start seeing trends over time and you could plot that the you know average sentence length um, for, for each speech across time for example and then compare that amongst different presidents Okay, but what, so what kind of uh, text do you usually work with or most commonly uh, in your PhD, for example, what? Oh, I, I, I'm afraid I don't do this kind of work okay. in my PhD. This was just my, my side project to, okay. to learn some of the tools. Um, okay. so, and the, if you, if you really want to, if you want to see this on, on actual examples of, of, of bigger corpus of text, the tidy textbook is really terrific. And she works with uh, the entirety of the, of the Jane Austen output across all six books as one example. And so that's a much richer data set for, for exploring and answering questions. Hmm. And she also, uh, uh, Julia and David also show how to, download whole corpuses of text from um, from uh, Gutenberg, uh, so from Project Gutenberg, which yeah. has free free online um, text of classic text. And there's a Gutenberg package in R, um, which allows you to easily download those texts. So if you want to play with this on on much bigger or me more meaningful sets of text, it's, it's easy to do. And the, the tidy textbook shows how to do that. Mm -hmm. But do you know of also any any other uh, like languages uh, that have been used for text analysis or like somebody who has done something interesting? Um, I mean, somebody somebody mentioned here Arabic, but um, but do you know of, of anything else that you've come across maybe or or somebody <laughs> to I'm, turn to? I'm afraid I haven't as a as a native English speaker. I yeah. haven't haven't looked at anything else. But that was something that was on my mind as I was yeah. giving this talk. Of, oh, hang on, I'm giving this talk to a, a group of people for whom probably English is is not the first language. So I'm afraid I don't know in Georgian um, no. what what's out there. But uh, but that well, I would imagine there is something. I'm I'm afraid yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no problem. I was just wondering. Um, and so, but these sentiment scores, are they um, sort of language specific um, measures? And, and um, so you mentioned a couple, I think, uh, are there like many of them or? There are three that are included in the tidy text package and those are all English language dictionaries. I don't know uh, kind of a, enough about how different languages to work if you could say find a data set which is an English word next to you know two columns the the, the English word and the Georgian translation you could presumably join those that data set with the sentiment data set to get the sentiment scores attached to the to the Georgian words or if you would want to be looking for a specific Georgian mm -hmm. um, sentiment set. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's someone saying that there are other lexicons that can be imported into our... I'm sure there are. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm glad that there is some more, some more no, local knowledge being shared. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, feel free to ask. I was... Can I, can I ask a question? Uh, okay. Yeah, please. Um, uh, so there's in uh, the tidy text package, there's this uh, the data frame that is the words pair per row and there's also other packages that have that data table that is in that is that is called a sparse matrix i think uh, where you have a word per document i think which means that most, most of the documents do not have the specific word the right. rows are, so um, what, what's the difference between the two if you if you know something about it i as much as i understand there's difference be, because in tidy text formats you can work in a tidy universe yes but are there, any, are there any other differences that's, uh, that's important that you have to take into consideration when you're working uh, on text, when you're analyzing a text? Which, which uh, data frame should you choose to work with? I have only worked with text in a tidy format, so I'm afraid I, I can't speak to working with, with texts in matrix format. 
I would imagine if you're working with really huge corpuses that matrices are going to be faster than 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 data frames, but I suspect it's going to be specific to to the data you have, the size of data that you have, and the tools that you want to use to to work with it. Um, I'm not sure if the tidy text package includes tools to convert from data frames to other formats for working with text. I have a feeling in the back of my mind that I saw something somewhere I, that I they have read that did, but I'm not. They, they, have it. they have the function to transform from tidy format to untidy formats. Okay, awesome. then um, I haven't covered that myself, um, but I imagine they would then explain in the book when it would be appropriate to do that and, and when it wouldn't. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I can't be of more help. No, it's all right. Thank you. One thing I was also wondering um, was like the, the graphs that you showed of these like a word cloud graphs, they, they seemed very similar to what you use in social network analysis. So, so is, that, um, is that coming from there or is, and is that common in, in this kind of analysis? Do you know? Um, my experience with word clouds is that they are useful when you want to have like a, a quick visual punch uh sorry the punch is probably the wrong word but if you want to have a a very quick glimpse i tend to think of them as something that's popular outside of statistics um or, or serious data analysis but in part because i used to work in market research and my boss really liked them um to show to to clients uh, sort of something that the business leaders liked of reviews of their products what words are standing out but i i'm not sure that they are if you really want to to understand um i don't know the, the frequencies or, or the relationships i'm not sure that they're yeah they're particularly robust to that but um but sometimes they, they can look really nice. Sometimes you have to fiddle with them a lot to get them to look nice. And you've got to be careful about what words are being included and what words aren't. Um, but you can do some really cool things with them. You can put masks on them. So you can have the, um, the GG Word Cloud package, for example, uses words to do with love. And it shows how you can put them all in a heart. You know, it's, it's mm. nice. It's kind of, yeah. it's pretty sweet. But um, I think it's, it's, it's personal preference. They, they can have a, a visual impact, but uh, mm -hmm. it's one of one of many tools. Yeah, yeah. So, but is the, do you know if there's like some kind of principles that then you can use for grouping these um, words together, or it's it's just more like randomly, or like how how do they form the clusters? <laughs> uh, so the actual placement of the words uh, on a word cloud are. Uh, um, that there's an algorithm for it. There is an element of randomness. So if you want to recreate, you need to set your seed. Um, and there are both in the word cloud function and uh, in the geons in the GG word cloud package, there are various arguments for, for controlling controlling those. So you can tweak to get them to to look as you as mm -hmm. you hopefully something close to to what you find visually satisfying. Okay. Thank Does that you. answer your question? Uh, I think, yeah, well, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I would have to go really uh, deeper into this uh, to find out. Because, I mean, my I have done some social network, uh, well, I'm interested in social network analysis, so so... I have heard of it a bit more, maybe than... Oh, well, than... sorry, I'm talking about the word cloud. The word clouds have nothing to do with networks at all. Uh, sorry, no. you're talking about the graph I was showing. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there oh, was sorry, a graph. I, I was yeah. talking about a completely different part oh, of the talk. Okay. Apologies. <laughs> sorry, uh, you were talking about the um, about so the relationships between words. Yeah. So there was a sort of a graph that was really similar to what you use in social network analysis. Uh, oh right. Okay. Um, sorry, you were talking about. Hang on, just let me go back. Uh, were you talking about about this page here? Yeah. And, and oh, like, sorry, I was just answering questions about work. Oh, okay, okay, no problem. <laughs> um, yes, well, 
Absolutely. Any, any form of relationship, be it relationship between words, be it relationship between people, between uh, sort of anything that can be conveyed by, by a, a network can be plotted by, yeah. by a graph. So this, um, I don't know if you've come across the tidy graph and the GGRAPH packages before, but they work really nicely together. They're written by the same guy. They're both written by Thomas and Pedersen and they work really, really nicely together. Um, but like the principles, how these words um, group together, are they then based on some kind of, I don't know, what kind of criteria or like how, um, yeah. Are you, are you, sorry, are you talking about the layout of the graph or are you talking I, about? I guess, I guess it's a layout, but I, I wonder also about the content, uh, content wise, are they then content wise related somehow as well? Are there like content clusters as well? Ah, yeah. So here I'm just plotting the 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 actual relationships, which words link to other words. But as it's a graph, I'm assuming that you could apply any sort of standard graph analysis that you want to any sort of clustering algorithms. Uh, not, um, uh, oh goodness, I haven't I haven't actually studied graphs much, but I think you've got like centrality measures. Or yeah, yeah, things like that. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Well, I'm as as a graph, I think you would be able to apply any of those you know anything that you can do on a graph you should yeah. be able to do on these graphs okay yeah okay good to know uh right, so this isn't a particularly connected or interesting graph no. but I, I i don't know if, if if running that kind of analysis on this would be particularly interested in interesting on this toy example but um yeah. but yes you can it's it's just a graph it's it's a graph object and you could work with okay. it like a graph object Okay, so does um, anyone else have any questions? Or maybe, maybe, uh, so I, yeah, just a general question <laughs> um, about yourself. Um, uh, so you, I, I understand that you have a background in humanities and then you moved, to, well, in math and, and humanities? Uh, yeah, I've, I've, in the early parts of, of my career, I tried to keep both going as long as possible. So I studied the math with the philosophy. I studied history, but of math, I, you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, very cool. <laughs> yeah. I, so you get a bit of everything. <laughs> yes. Well, my idea originally was that I wanted to be a math teacher. And I thought if by the time I was a math teacher, I knew about math, philosophy of math, history of math, math education theory, that I could go in the classroom and be the most interesting teacher that, that ever there was in math. Um, it didn't quite work out like that, and now I'm doing stats. <laughs> but uh, but which that is, was the same thing. which is a bit different from math, uh, I guess. So uh, I don't know how much uh, it is. It actually, helps. Yeah. As a, as an undergraduate, I was interested in the purest of pure maths. I love set theory and logic yeah. and and things like that. So this has been a real. It's been an interesting uh, career path. Hmm. When um, w what happened was when I stopped teaching. It was around the time where Hal Valerian from Google was famously saying that statistics was a, like the sexy job of the 21st century. And, and um, I thought, well, that sounds like something I'd like to get in on then. If it's, if it's good job, if it's, if it's interesting, um, relevant and good job prospects, and I've got the mass brain to, to do it, then, uh, then why not? Hmm. And actually, as I've been getting involved in stats, I've been more and more moving towards applied stats and programming and less and less interested in the, in the math side of it. Hmm. So do you use also other programs uh, now or is R your main tool? R is my main tool. Uh -huh. I, I started programming, I learned Python first, but, uh, but then uh, moved quickly to R when I started working in stats and haven't looked back from that. Hmm. Um, I love using R. It's, it's, I, I find it a, a great language to use. I love the R community. I think that um, the, 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 I love the, the tidyverse and, and everything. I just, watching that, watching that grow has been fantastic and now we have tidy models and there are all kinds of I just so much new stuff happening all the time that makes it easier and easier to do the kind of analysis I need to do really well really and and, and make it look good 
Well, sounds good. <laughs> so, uh, so I hope uh, your PhD will go well. And, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for agreeing uh, for giving a talk for us. We have already many good words. <laughs> oh well, thank you very much. It's been my my absolute pleasure. And yeah, um, yeah. good luck with everything. <laughs> and as I said, my the, the slides are online, so are my contact details. So yeah, I'm happy yeah. To to carry on the chat. I'm, I'm glad that the people enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yes, so thank you uh, very much. Uh, and I'll just say quickly that uh, we have um, next meetup, online meetup planned for the 14th of uh, July. Uh, and uh, we don't have the exact topic yet, uh, but it will be given by, uh, I don't know if I pronounced correctly, but by uh, Rocio Yo uh, from the University of Florida. And she's a movement ecologist, but she's been also doing some some uh, text analysis, but I think something completely different from what you've di you've been just uh, talking about. So oh, I've just scratched the surface. <laughs> a huge topic. There'll be so much more to to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this was really a very good introduction. So um, so we well, know where it's to given go. You a taste of the kind of things you might be able to. Yeah. Do. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, everyone. Yeah. Enjoy your weekend and uh, have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Bye.